Welcome back to another episode of I'd Laugh at Be Shaving. Dude. <laughs> I didn't say animal shirt. I said animal skin. Oh, damn. I got the wrong memo. I'm wearing my 1991 Kentucky Derby shirt. This is for the 80s party. Ah. Oh. 80s BC. Today we're talking about the origins of the barbershop and how this entire myth and legend came to be. All this and more on today's episode of I I'd Laugh to Be Shaving. <laughs> Please, attack. 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 Behold. 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 <laughs> so, barbershops. Barbershops. Barbershop. <laughs> Barbersal. Barberside. Barbra Streisand. That will be the gift you give yourself. Typical. <laughs> You'd expect that from him. But we're going to start with the origin of the barbershop. Where did it all come from? Where did it all begin? There was a time when medicine and barbering were one. Like alchemy and religion. They were intertwined. Much like the red and white stripes on a barber pole. It's true, folks. Why is this? Why well, is it? Because back in the day, the barber was also your local physician. Really? Bloodletting. Oh, Bloodletting. We should think about doing that sometime. <laughs> It'll never go over. Not with this crowd. Regardless, so we're often asked and we often hear, you know, different things. Where does the barber pole come from? What does it mean? Is it just a patriotic thing in this country, the red, white, and blue? Or is there something deeper and darker? It actually is veins and arteries because they were, like Douglas said, they were doing minor procedures such as bloodletting, which used to be used as a cure-all for just about anything. You have a stomach ache, let out some blood. Who pints? <laughs> Too much of a headache? Two pints. It's time to open up a vein. <laughs> Two pints. But I've heard different stories, too, um, that the actual, there was drying posts in front, like where you tie your horse. Uh, when you weren't tying your horse, though, the rags that you use to clean up, After a up, surgical procedure? Yeah, you'd rinse them out in water, whatnot. Or really then, bad straight razor shave? In dirty water. And uh, hang them over the pole. So and you really didn't get the blood out, so you'd see them blowing in the wind, and it would look like the motion of a barber pole. So I've heard a couple things. The red, white, and blue, though, that's more in the United States, you see. Yeah, I, I think that does have a patriotic twang. I think it. that's more of the Marvies. You know, when Marvies took over the commercial side of barber uh, barber poles, they added that blue in there, which could have been the vein, because I've heard that, you know, blood is actually kind of blue as it goes uh, there after it's oxygenated. Sure, or but before. there were hundreds of years after the fact with that. Like, I mean, it's an afterthought, if anything. But I think it was more of a patriotic thing that the states were going for. Because in England, and in the UK, and in Europe... It's just red and white? Yeah, you don't see red, white, and blue. Huh. Interesting. I mean, I could be wrong. I don't think I am. If some, one of you know this... Let us know. You know what to do. You know what to do. Well, another big... Speaking of Marvies, another big tradition is the Marvies containers. I mean, you can't go out antiquing or get involved with barber collecting or razor collecting without running across... <laughs> Some Marvies uh, cans. In fact, there's all sorts of people who just collect Marvies accessories. Oh, Barberside. Oh, Barberside. Barberside. And, you know, this one is a modern one from, like, a beauty supply store um, that, you can, that you can use. There is some misconception, though. I think when people get into the double-edged razor thing or straight razors, they're always asking, hey, how do I disinfect this? How do I sanitize this? And the first thing that comes in their mind is Marvies. Barberside. Oh. Or, bar or Barberside. Either one. In fact, the product you usually put inside of a Marvies container is Barbicide. It's true. Um, but I would say that these things were really designed for combs. Like they, you know, they're great for a comb to go in. You know, you could pull the comb out in between customers. and they, Scissors. Yeah, scissors. You know, that's great. But when you make up a jar of this, you're adding a concentrate of Barbicide and then a lot of water. And that water is sometimes an enemy of things like safety razors and straight razors that react with water or whatever else is in the barber side. Which can react with certain metals, such as aluminum. That's what comes to mind. I yeah. put an aluminum uh, 
D razor into a gyro right. blaster side, and it turned pretty much black. Yeah, in fact, recently at a, at a local meet of the Big Shave West, a customer walked up to us and said, man, I put this in some uh, barber side, and it's black now. So you're yeah. absolutely true. Yeah, That's I'm incorrect. absolutely true. True that. <laughs> you're on the plane? True, true. <laughs> Sorry, inside joke. Yeah. Okay. It wasn't even there. <laughs> So um, I think this whole myth around this is is kind of more about the combs and other kind of you know maybe barbershop accessories, but maybe not the best idea at home because again, you're also not trying to sterilize against yourself necessarily. Really, just the best way to disinfect at home is with a toothbrush, some hot water, and some dish detergent or dishwasher. Yeah, dishwasher would be great too. Steam cleaning. Or, or, as I like to use, isopropyl alcohol. Yeah, that's Now, great. this is a really great to have in your shave kit or, uh, you know, in your uh, shave station. 91%. And yep. it need not be in uh, a bottle like this. It can also be in a spray bottle, which mm. I find more effective, especially when it comes to uh, sterilizing razors or disinfecting them. And it aids in the drying process yeah. as well. You spr spritz on a little bit of that. And it, dry, it speeds up the drying process. Yeah, it'll help evaporate whatever else is on it. So I like these visually. I collect them. They're in my uh, shave in your station. Den. Yeah, but I use isopropyl in them. So you fill this up. What if you didn't want to have to buy one of these? Is there like maybe an alternative? There is. Ah, I'm glad I asked. Coffee. Um, <laughs> okay, so you know with French presses, they come and go. Sometimes they break. You have to buy the new one. But you, you're usually left with the components. I know I always am. But if you have, how many you, French presses do you have? Many. I have a problem, um, but or you maybe you just want to you bought a single French press, which also works for this as well. But when you're this, single, when you're single, this makes a great. You know the reason why I use this also is for uh, single edge blades. Okay. If I have a, a bunch of razors in rotation and one of them happens to be a single edge, a the gem, actual blade itself, a gem style. Yeah. If you ha get, if it stays apart from the last time you used it, they tend to rust faster than yeah. D. Or they just tend to rust where D's don't as often. Uh, I think carbon steel is a lot more. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I would put them in this in between uses. And what I do is... Mm, they're both kind of thick glass containers. I see that. They're about the same. That. Okay. Almost like a beaker, too. Like, pretty beaker. Heavy-duty glass here. Yeah, it is. It's very lab s. And you just take this thing apart. You see remnants of coffee. Um, and then all you need is the screen. So this thing, you can chuck. Or save. Choice is up to you. Ah, okay, that way. Exactly. And then I put my blades in here with a little bit of alcohol, and then when I want to get them, I just pull that up. It's pretty much the blades. same concept. Same exact concept. As this. Yeah. So this is a poor man's uh, barber side or, or Marvy jar. So that's a real quick, dirty, easy way of doing that. I like that. That's a pretty good idea. And I like the idea of the alcohol. If you wanted to get real authentic, I guess you could add like blue food coloring if you wanted that authentic barbershop yeah, blue look. Blue number. Three. Sure. All right. Stuff at the grocery store. Yeah. The stuff that causes cancer. Anyways, so, so moving right along, when, it, when you think of barber, uh, barber side, when you think of the barber shop, what else do you think of? It's on the table. I mean, Panad Clubman is one of the most like classic things that when you get started with double edge. Iconic. Yeah. Everyone thinks about smell. It literally is used on the back bar of a lot of barber shops. It has that look, and I think it goes right across the board. I mean, like sometimes the barber shop scent is it's yeah. geographical. You know, I mean that really some some people think Floyd if they're you know in Spain. Yeah, no, I think of I think of the uh, East Coast kind of barber shop like old school or maybe I, like England or something. I think even in France they think of this. I think in Europe Clubman was all over the place at the time, um, and there's a lot of confusion and history around Clubman also. Uh, this, as you can see, is a vintage bottle. Ooh. And this is a modern bo bottle. Do I get to do a smell aroma? Yeah, let, let Matt do a smell aroma. Yes, so I've never smelled this before. Now, Pinot Clubman was originally founded in 1810. Or was it? <laughs> Actually, Edouard Pinard was born in 1810. Yet on the bottles, it says found in 1810, and I think that's a little like misnomer. He was actually probably born in between 1805 and 1810. What do you think? Pretty good. Oh my god. Now smell this. Oh, don't ever do that again. My glands, my glands. Um, <laughs> my glands. The perfume house that he actually came into possession of was um, found in Nowhere near the same. Holy cow, that's so different. Exactly. And that was Le Grand Parfum House. Uh, so I think that's where the confusion lies. That was started in 1810. He took it over in probably about 1830. Okay. And so that's possibly the, the source of the Smith and confusion. Uh, his first big uh, cologne at the time was Lalac Vegetal. 
A lot of you are familiar with that. A lot of you hate that because it smells like cat pee. <laughs> it really does. Although at the time, it was so popular. It kind of looks like cat pee. As the other myth goes on, uh, that Napoleon and his troops were huge fans of this. Okay. This is around 1833. This was a right. big myth going around. Oh, going around after 1833. Fact, 1833. However, Napoleon was dead by 1833. So it kind of was a myth. Totally a myth. Okay. Uh, but it was so, you know, the, the whole myth was like, he was so popular among the troops, he became, right. he was elected royal perfumer. And, uh, which he was, in fact, but it had nothing to do with Napoleon. Uh, 1890s uh, brought Pignard's Bay Rum, especially to the United States. They ended up moving their way over to the United States. After, like, he was uh, elected royal perfumer, world domination began for Clubman. Right. Now, the stuff going on in uh, France was more potent. It was colognes. Whereas in the United States... Once they opened up shop here, they started diluting stuff and experimenting with it. Um, more aftershaves, more bay rums. And again, this is 1890s. This is also around the time that uh, Edward died. Hmm. Yeah. And so the shop was taken over. But um, they started experimenting with bay rum. They opened up a shop in New York. Uh, bay rum flew off the shelves, as it did at the time, with everyone who put one out. He was also touring around with a stuff called... What well, was a powder? It was a powder um, a Roman... I think it was Roman smelling salt perfume is what they called it. And so it was a powder, so you'd have to add something. It was to a it? preparation, which okay. was a lot. I mean, a lot of like uh, uh, perfumers at the time were doing stuff like this, and it was around the time of uh, scented handkerchiefs. Okay. Which you would put powder on, and then when you were sweating, you'd pat your head. Uh, um, okay. So this was with that in mind. It would activate it, but you could also activate it with alcohol or water. And so this is where the talc scent comes in. And this is kind of a direct ancestor of the Pignard Clubman as we know it, that powdery top talc note. That wasn't popular in Europe. In fact, that was thought to be cheap, uh, which was interesting because Europeans were getting their hands on some of the American-made stuff. And the American factory and the, our perfume house and the uh, French perfume house, they were at odds with each other. The uh, French were, you know, thought that what we were doing in America was, was just... Enchanté. Just cheap. Um, however, with the popularity, though, when people bring this back to, the, uh, to, to Europe and whatnot... They had to sell it in France. They wanted to sell it. So it was, let's see what they did. So the French company would prepare the scent, then send it to the United States. The United States would uh, dilute it and then send it back to Europe. <laughs> and meanwhile, the French company's the entire time saying it's less of a product. Right. But they were still selling it. Uh, it's probably what kept them alive as well. So that is the history of that. Really. Um, another thing I might add is, unlike Aqua Velvet and a lot of these other companies... They weren't popular in uh, the stores, Clubman. They were more popular in the barbershops, and they wanted to keep it that way. Um, so you, you basically would have to go to a barbershop to actually be you know, have it put on to. You wouldn't go down to the grocery store. And you would buy it. a sample. You would buy a jar of you it, buy at, it at, the, the at the barbershop. <clears throat> and that, you know, and this is all around the 1930s and 1940s, and that's when the Clubman line was created was in the 1940s. Okay. Um, so was it created for the U.S. audience, the, the name Clubman? No, the name club. Oh, actually, yeah, it was because it was most popular in like the country clubs. Okay, it was really like a word of mouth in the know kind of sense. Right. Um, and, you know, actually, a lot of celebrities at the time were known to rock it. In fact, like who? James Bond. I know he's not a celebrity, but he's a fictional character. Cary was, Grant. Was in the book, Cary Grant. Bob Hope, Kirk Douglas, Robert Mitchum. He got busted for weed. Um, Henry Fonda and uh, Donald Trump. Cool. That's right, folks. So that's a little brief history on Clubman. There's a lot online you can dig up. But uh, again, the information is kind of, you got to weed through truth versus fact. There's a lot, of, a lot of fiction out there. In fact, on the company site itself, I mean, again, founded in 1810, and they just go on this tangent. You kind of have like an, a, a, a version of the truth. That's, yeah, okay. yeah, but it's like, it's, the truth is out there. You can't handle the truth. Well, the truth that I noted between this original or this kind of vintage Versus and that, that one's a lot sweeter smelling. I don't get any sweetness. Well, it could, you know, it could have to do with Settle the age as well. I mean, like, if you notice the color, too. Right. Doesn't necessarily mean that this is, it lost its color or scent or whatever softened during its aging process, but that could have something to do with it. We don't know for okay. sure. Uh, and this was part of a gift set at the time. Right, I see that. A gift for you. Yeah, but good stuff. I highly recommend it if you can pick up some. That one's really nice. Then we have the, I mean, they did a whole line. They had the, you know, the talcum powder, pomades. That's what I think of as the talcum powder for like the back of your neck. Um, I'm trying to think what it's called. They had a, a like a hair tonic called um, Bright Aside, Bright, Brill, 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 Brillante, Brilliant. It's play on Brilliant, actually, and that was very popular with the barbers. Um, but mustache wax, too, they're still selling to this day. It's a petro based mustache wax, but. Um, it also works great for. Uh... Hair pomade in a pinch. Notice what Matt's doing today with his hair. <laughs> I 
you have forgot pomade. my hair product. Yeah, when you forget pomade, there's a little it's trick right there for you. a little wax in it. So, um, but one other quick thing on barbering that, um, speaking of you know talcum powder, when you go to the barber shop and they trim the back of your neck, they usually do like dust it on. With the brush? They used a big brush, and I actually have seen a lot of people thinking that those larger than life brushes, brushes were shave brushes. Yeah. And I've even seen ones from like Double Duck and like really big popular names, and it's a big fat brush. So if you see one of those brushes out there, they just look unusually large, like four or five inch loft. That is a uh, duster brush for the back of your neck, or I guess on your neck after you shave, but it's not for building a lather. Not at all. Though yeah. you can try it. Eh. We don't judge here. It's like a paintbrush. Some of them had tubes that you could fill up with a towel and it would come out. Okay. It had like a shaker underneath the bristles. And so right. as you did it, powder would fly out of that. But the talcum powder, it's, it was huge in barbering. And that's why I think a lot of these barbershop scents come from. It's based on yeah. what, you know, just other things they were using in the barbershop. To kind of, um, yeah, Perfect. compliment, yeah. compliment. So another thing about barbershops uh, that kind of, again, the barbershop of yesteryear versus the barbershop of today, Back in the day, you could go into a barber shop and you'd see the barber using a strop and a, and a real straight razor and, and shaving you. Ever since, I don't know, the 1970s, 1960s, maybe a little later, it did vary state by state. You really see hygienic kind of codes getting away from the use of real steel straight razors and really kind of favoring more of disposable blades like Shavette style or Artist Club, like professional style Oh, it goes blades. even farther back. Really? Cause, yeah, because uh, beauticians weren't using straight razors. They weren't training it. They were using shavettes. Okay. I actually have a vintage Italian one I meant to bring with me today that my mom gifted me. She was uh, a beautician back in the day, and she went to school in the 50s for this. Okay. So uh, that's where that actual piece came from. But that was, yeah, that's where the shavettes come from. It was really a barbering tool for shaping. Not for shaping the face, but for shaping the nape of the neck. Well, um, and you've got to think, I mean... Finishing. If, if you're a barber and you're just trying to make a buck or whatever off of a haircut, all this maintenance around straight razors is really not very conducive. I mean, you have to strop it, you have to sharpen it. Well, you got to send them out. There's barber hones. I mean, there is all sorts of upkeep versus just disposing of that blade and putting a brand new one. Plus, the customer is also a little more reassured that in case you didn't sanitize it, it's no big deal in between shaves. It's true. The other big thing uh, from the barbershop of yesteryear that we kind of see uh, remnants of is the barbershop mug, the shaving mug itself. Ah, good call. So occupational mugs back in the day, if you were a teacher or a firefighter or whatever, you would go to the barbershop and they would literally have a cabinet up on the wall with every all their patrons' different mugs. And the mug was waiting for you oh, more or less. that's what you meant. I was going to start doing occupational mugs. Check this out. What's this? Okay. Mortician. Oh. Occupational. Okay. I thought like the walrus, the mustache. I am a walrus. Well, so, you know, you'd be, you'd go in, you'd get your, your shaving mug and it'd be waiting for you and usually would say on the front like teacher, firefighter, whatever. Um, and to mine. Yeah. And so you'd be reassured again that that was your mug, that no one else had used it, it was waiting for you. And so even today, these are really collectible. And you see this in pubs still to the day, you know. Yeah, kind of like your Stein. club. Yeah, yeah your Stein. On the wall. Very similar. I probably started with the barbershop. Maybe. Maybe. Who's Let say? us know if you know that exact history. Let us know if you know. But people also then kind of uh, took that same concept and brought it home, the shaving mug at your home. Another thing I've always... Air breather. <laughs> breather. Another thing I've always kind of been mystified with is the hot towel shave, the hot lather shave. You know, because if you look at old barbering manuals, they actually talk about all the benefits of cold water shaving and how, you know, the skin's tighter and the hairs lift up. But this whole idea of a really hot towel shave, I, that's from the barbershop. But I really think the hot foam comes from the Mr. Foamy things that, you know, would be on the back bar of the barbershop and you push the button and hot foam would come out. So like after shaving mugs kind of disappeared, I think people were used to that hot lather at the barbershop. I think that just it was something they had to sell because they had to at the time. I mean, it was cold water flats. Hot water wasn't prevalent, prevalent in those times. And exactly. they weren't going to heat up uh, you know, the, the kettle in between every customer, especially barbershops were hopping back in the day. They did use hot towels. In fact, a friend of mine has a... Oh yeah, they definitely use hot towels. They like, he, my buddy has a, a vintage, shape. yeah, he has a vintage barbershop and he has an old copper like boiler that would have all the towels in it ready to go that were steaming. I could see that being all prepped and ready to go hot towels, but I think the hot foam really came later. 
Um, yeah, no, I have to agree. I think it depends on the barbershop you went to at the time. Your little mom and pop barbershop probably wasn't using hot towels, and if they were, they could charge more for the shave. It's more of a luxurious thing. It's more of a thing maybe you couldn't get at home because, I mean, gosh, I have I've seen photos of people shaving in the kitchen like before hot water. That was it. If you wanted hot water, you can go to the kitchen. That's where the stove is. You can make a hot pot of water for a hot shave. Well, some have the kettle in their bathroom too at the times as well. When I've seen that. Flex. Maybe that's where Scuttles got their start. That is where Scuttles got their start. Well, when you pump, pump the water out out back. You bring it inside, you heat it up, and you pour it in the scuttle. The original scuttle, not a lather scuttle, a hot wa hot water scuttle. But I mean, like, I also think I think when hot water and cold water. I mean, like at the time, like, or rather, when uh, at, um, Gillette came into the home with their DE blades, now the barbershop had to compete for shaves with the home use. So that's where the luxury shaves come in as well. The hot water shaves, right. the hot lather shaves. They were competing for your attention. Right. We could speculate on all this, and that's really, at the end of the day, all we have right now. The beautiful thing about wet shaving right now is we saved it. Thanks to the internet, we know all this information now, but a lot was lost. Yeah. Or people need to share what they know, what little bit they know. And that's why we're asking you, our audience, to comment below and share what... Maybe you know some pieces of these puzzles that we are just speculating upon Some right of these now. traditions of the barber shop and how they correspond to today. Okay, I think I'm ready for the challenge. I hear it sucks. <laughs> it really sucks. Well, folks, what we're about to do right now is for you and for science. And for salud. Salud. We're going to uh, have leeches applied to us. You know, in the ancient tradition of bloodletting, we figured... Barbering. It was barbering back then. Barbering. Barbaric. You know, the same root word in Latin. Which was beard. Actually, yeah. the root word is beard. Barba. But, uh, yeah. But uh, we're we, going to... We figured the best way to demonstrate our dedication to the ancient barbering tradition... And the cause. ...was to let some bloodletting medical grade... Uh, large UK-based leeches be flown in and put onto our skin for you, the viewer. I am using the arm opposite of the arm I used for the magic powder episode. Doug is using the same one. In fact, I think we should put it in the same spot. <laughs> I don't think you have any say in this right Where there. Where are we putting it? Right there. Oh, God. Ha! I really don't have a problem with this at all. No, in fact, Doug has already been deciding... <laughs> <laughs> oh, God! Doug has already been deciding uh, oh, how he's going to save this leech so that he can put it in his aquarium or release it back to the wild. That's it's, not the case. Is it even going on? I don't taste good to leeches. God. I think you might need to find a smoother... No, no. He's just going to take root. He's actually enjoying... Oh, it's, it's actually... It's, lo ah! Ah! it's looking for a vein. Oh, my God. This is coming from the Phoenix boy who never grew up with rivers or lakes or streams. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to drink during this. I've been drinking. And I think he's getting drunk. He, that's the way I move when I've had a few. Yep, I'm just going to kill this freaking <laughs> leech by drinking and it's going to die. Wow, he's really, like, not finding... We don't taste good. Ah. Yeah, you might have to grab him and help him out. Okay. Oh, wait, wait. Is he taking... Yep. Ah, uh, well, the things we do. So, ancient barbering. This was huge. This this guy's on. Yep. <laughs> I can feel it. He's bloodletting. <laughs> oh, yeah, mine is too. My, my, uh, my, my uh, method here is to not look at it. But I can feel it. I actually can feel okay, it. Letting... He doesn't want to... <laughs> this guy wants to be on. I'm feeling the blood leaving me. <laughs> like... Of course, Doug, who was like, yeah, let's do this. Let's do this. And I'm like, oh, no, this is kind of freaky. Yep. So the competition is who can be the most attractive to a leech? It, that's what it's turning into. We were going to do how long we could each uh, withstand. Look at He's not taking to... Clearly, I have no blood. Clearly, this guy loves my blood. He, you, he'd rather stay on the. You know that feeling that when they're uh, when you're at the doctor and they're drawing blood out. That's what this feels like right now. Taking blood. It does feel like it's taking blood from yeah. me. Funny how that works. Being a leech. You guys suck. I feel worthless and inadequate. It's like catechism all over again. Why not me? <laughs> Why not me? 
confident. Now it's just doing the earthworm, like the dance move. Yeah, that's what I thought. Oh, you know what it might be? Did you rub aftershave on your arms? Yeah. <laughs> but did She's you? right. Maybe we should put it on our biceps. I'm not even interested in my bicep. <laughs> is anyone? Uh, is that they have a propensity for private parts? No. <laughs> what do you mean by that exactly? Depends who they belong to. Maybe we should have a leech race. <laughs> What's yours <laughs> doing? No, he's on. <laughs> I think he's on all right. Really? Yeah. Come on, that's where it is. That's the money one right there. Uh. Literally feeling weak. You're a not feeling weak. Maybe faint, but not weak. Don't I I've told you this is not my game. <laughs> I know my I know my limits. He knows his threshold, ladies and gentlemen. You're really pale. Are you feeling okay? No, not at all. <laughs> I told you guys this. I'm, yeah, I'm literally not feeling well at all. We need to call this. No! Matt is getting so... in the Jeff, show. get a bucket. I'm serious. I'm going to throw up. Well, folks, we tried. Um, all I have to say is... Mine's on. If you want... <laughs> and I'm not if you want to enter it. our giveaway, <laughs> just Dun like, Dun subscribe. I did okay. Vomit in the bucket, Matt. Once again, I didn't want to win... And Doug wanted to win, but I still won somehow because mine's actually on. You didn't win. I, I won. No, you didn't. I got this snail trail all over my arm, too. You know what? I'm just going to end this all no, no. right now. Do it. Do it. F*** it. <laughs> but anyways, like, subscribe, and comment below to enter our giveaway of aftershave and soap. This leech wants nothing to do with me. Oh, God. I think it's sleeping. Can you see? No, it's sucking, dude. <laughs>